Is it possible to eat electricity? We all know that electricity powers the tools that help us grow and prepare our food. But what if I told you there's a way to cut out the middleman and go straight to eating electricity? I'm going to introduce you to some incredible bacteria that actually eat electrons and then poop them out and show you how you can actually harness this process to create a bacteria fuel cell and how we can utilize other useful bacteria that love to eat weird things in order to clean the air in our home. No matter where you live, if you just go out and start digging through the mud around your house, Chances are that you'll end up getting a sample of two types of bacteria called Schuonella and Geobacter. These bacteria are called electroactive bacteria, and they've evolved to actually eat electrons. We are all alive due to the fact that electrons are flowing from a high potential energy to a lower potential energy in our body. We eat sugars that have excess electrons, and the electrons end up flowing eventually to oxygen that accepts these electrons. Now the nice thing about having oxygen accept the electrons finally is that it can diffuse into our blood and get inside of our cells in order to accept those electrons. But what if we evolved in a place that didn't have oxygen to accept the electrons? For example, deep down in the mud. There isn't a lot of oxygen there, so the bacteria that live there can't use oxygen to give the electrons to. But fortunately, in the mud, there's a lot of metal oxides. These metal oxides can accept electrons, but the only problem is that they can't get through the cell membrane of the bacteria. So the bacteria evolved a way to transfer the electrons externally. The bacteria in this mud have evolved conductive appendages, tiny nanowires that can grow and connect to anything out there that will accept electrons. So they can pass electrons to anything they touch or anything around them using these nanowires, or even by sending out electron-carrying molecules. Because all of this electron transfer happens outside of their cells, that means that you can get them to pass their electrons to an electrode and then use that electrode to power a light or run a simple circuit. In order to do this, I'm going to take some of this mud that I collected and put them into these cups. Then I'm gonna place a conductive sponge connected to wires and fill the rest up with mud. Then at the very top, I'll put another conductive sponge with a wire connected to it. If everything goes right, then after a few days, I should be able to measure a voltage between these two wires. So let's measure the starting voltage right now. You can see that it's almost nothing, just a few millivolts. This is because any bacteria that are in here already haven't had time to grow and make the electrical connections to the anode at the bottom. So I'm gonna just set them here and let them grow for a few days, and then we'll measure the voltage. Now it's been almost 10 days. Let's measure the voltage on here. 0.79 volts, 0.8 volts, and 0.81 volts. You can see that we can get a significant voltage from these now. In fact, they have enough voltage now that I can run a small circuit with them. If I attach it to a capacitor, I can store the charge so it has enough power to power an LED light. We're literally creating light from bacteria. I can even run a clock with it. I now have a bacteria-powered clock. But what is the actual energy source in these? Well, in this case, the bacteria are breaking down the organic matter that was naturally in the mud and then passing the electrons through the circuit and they eventually end up at the cathode where they can join oxygen atoms and make water. But the cool thing is they don't have to use organic matter as their energy source. Since the bacteria have these external wires that can transfer electrons to the inside of them, they can actually just use pure electrons as a food source instead of organic matter. So if I gave them an external source of electrons and applied a voltage like this to the electrode, then the bacteria actually use this as a source of food. So these bacteria are actually living and thriving with no food source besides the electrons I'm feeding them. Scientists have actually done this in the lab and shown that these bacteria can grow with only electrons as their food source. But these bacteria fuel cells are most useful not when we feed them electricity, but when they make electricity from rotten things in the mud. Right now, about 3% of the total energy in the US goes to cleaning up wastewater. What's frustrating about this is that the wastewater has a lot of organic material in it that still has usable energy. In fact, there's more energy in the wastewater than it takes to treat the wastewater. So technically, that means that we could use the energy from the wastewater to clean it up. One way that we could do that is to use these electroactive bacteria to break down the organic matter and convert it to electricity like we're doing here. 
And just like these bacteria have evolved to eat electrons, these bacteria have evolved to eat pollutants. Some of the most dangerous pollutants in the air are called VOCs. It stands for volatile organic compounds. The most dangerous of these are benzene and toluene. What's crazy about these pollutants is that they're typically found in higher levels inside your house rather than outside of your house because of resins and paints and all sorts of different building materials and man-made stuff that are found inside your house. For example, I have a meter that can detect some of the VOCs in the air. If I just spray this can duster, you can see how the levels rise around me. Fortunately, regular old house plants offer a natural way to mitigate these harmful substances. Most plants will remove a tiny amount of the VOCs from the air. They absorb some of these toxic molecules from the air and push them into the soil. And bacteria have learned that if they live close to the plant roots, they can get all these high energy carbon compounds that the plant is pushing into the soil. Researchers have isolated specific strains of bacteria right here called Pseudomonas putida. Through five years of natural selection, this strain specifically has been engineered to remove 30 times the amount of VOCs from the air and soil compared to the normal strain. So if you combine the best bacteria for removing these VOCs along with the best plant, then you get a natural filter for VOCs. This is called the NeoPX. The plant portion of it is called pothos or devil's ivy. By itself, it's the best plant for removing VOCs from the air. But when you combine it with the bacteria in the soil, then you get a super plant at removing VOCs from the air. They've done tests with this plant by pouring in VOCs in a tank, and you can actually see the concentration decrease over time. Even when just a single plant's in a big room, you can notice a difference. Neoplants actually sponsored this video and sent me this plant so I could talk about the science behind it. All you have to do is water it and then monthly replenish the bacteria in the soil with these tiny packets they call power drops. The pot is designed to let air flow to the bacteria as well, so it doesn't only rely on the plant to push it into the soil. This is really cool because most of the air purifiers that remove VOCs from the air have very expensive filters that have to be replaced regularly and the fan always has to be running. So it's annoying and you're constantly using power. But NeoPX is such a cool technology that it uses nature to our advantage. Neoplants just filmed a cool video on their YouTube channel where their CEO dives into the science behind NeoPX. So if you want to learn more about them, I'll put that video link in the description and you can check it out. And thanks for watching another episode of the Action Lab and we'll see you next time.